do you know about the various different ARRS roles that are around to kind of help you in general practice and your PCN and that kind of stuff? Well, this year with the new contract, there have been various different changes and additional roles that have been added that you may want to utilize for your network. And in this episode, I'm going to give you a quick guide of the various different roles and the key things that you need to know about the ARRS roles reimbursement scheme and what you need to do this year. Let's get cracking straight to it. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. If this is the first time we're meeting, I'm Dr. Gandalf of EGP Learning, where I look at supporting you with technology-enhanced primary care and learning. And in this episode, I'm going to give you a complete guide to the various additional roles reimbursement scheme, or ARS roles, that are available to you to use in your networks or in your practice, and to try and help deal with patient demand, but also to see if you can deliver better primary care. Now, I know this is a bone of contention for many different people, and this is simply a guide to the various different types of roles and my own little twist of how you may want to consider using them. Additionally, we're going to cover the key points you do need to be aware of in terms of using the various different roles. Let's get started, shall we? In terms of the guidance for this particular talk, it's really important you have a look at the PCN DES contract. I'll put a link to that down below, so make sure you check that out because that is the document I've been using to base this discussion on. So just a quick summary to start off with, those that aren't aware about the various different roles that are available, each network gets an allocation of the amount of funding that they have to basically get the various different roles that exist. This has been going on for the past couple of years and we're now in year three, so therefore most people should be aware of various different aspects of this. But just to summarize, obviously you've got that funding, you can't use that funding for anything else, you can only use it for the roles themselves, apart from there is a small amount of funding that is available for the social link prescribing workers that you can use to um, pay for companies to help support with the management of that. But the funding is effectively for the role itself and not for additional stuff like equipment or for HR charges, all that kind of stuff that's not included in the ARS role scheme. So what does that mean for you? The additional thing you need to be aware about is this concept of additionality. Now, this is really important, and particularly from this year onwards, is something that many networks are going to have to pay attention to. Additionality is the concept that, simply put, the PCNs have to be creating additional workforce for their footprint in order to make sure that they're doing something. That sounds kind of simple, doesn't it? But then you need to factor in the fact there are so many changes that may be happening in general practice and within networks themselves. So you may be having practices leave, practices join, you may be having practices close completely. What does that mean for the additionality concept? You've also got changes within the actual staffing of the practices themselves and within the network staff that are available. Because actually now we may have people leaving networks, we may have different people joining networks, and we may be looking at different roles, particularly with the ICS is kicking off. So this concept of additionality is something that many people need to be aware of. It's really important that the baseline figures that many networks are using are based predominantly on the clinical roles. So that's the pharmacist, that's the physician's associate, that's the physiotherapist and the paramedics. Yeah, they're all P's, aren't they? But those are the key ones where you can actually change the amount of roles that you have to match the baseline. So for example, if you end up having more PCN pharmacists that can help balance off the the aspect of having less physiotherapists and that kind of stuff. The baseline figures for the other roles aren't really something that is going to be centered upon. They are going to be counted, don't get me wrong, but it's not that there's less of a concern about those particular roles when it comes to the additionality. It is about developing clinical workforce to help in practice and see patients and things. So it's really important you pay attention to the additionality part of the document. The next part is the actual funding itself. Now, how much funding do you have? This is something that's a little bit tricky to work out because it does change year on year and it is based on the amount of population that you have at the start of the year, so on January the 1st. If you want a really cool tool that will help you do this, I mean, NHS England have provided some details of this to you, but there's a really nice tool that can help you balance the various different roles and stuff, and I'll put that down below. That's provided by the GP Rotor team. It's a really nice web tool. I really like it. It also looks at the various different other aspects like your funding and stuff. And we talked about that in more detail in our overview video for the PCN DES contract, which you'll get linked to at the end. But what are the key changes for this particular year? Well, before we get into the individual roles, there are a few things you just need to be aware of. So number one, that there is a limit in the mental health workers that you can actually apply for. This is because they're now going to be shared with the mental health trust themselves. And at the most, you can have a one whole time equivalent unless you have a population over 100,000 for your PCN network, in which case actually you can go for more at that point. That's two whole time equivalents. We're still waiting confirmation on whether or not that includes one for adult mental health workers and one for child mental health workers, because there is a weird line in the contract that states that there may be a difference. Still waiting for confirmation on that. So NHS England, if you can give us that, really appreciate it. 
But until we get that confirmation, at the moment, it's one whole time equivalent for mental health workers for this financial year. We do also have some additional roles that have been added into the mix, and we'll be covering that towards the end. So make sure you stick around for that, and we'll be able to give you all the details about these new additional roles and how you may want to consider using them. So EGP learners, just as I've been editing this video, we've had a little bit of clarification that's come in about this whole concept of how many mental health workers you can actually have. You can technically have two mental health workers if, and there are a couple of conditions with this, number one, your local mental health trust agrees to help support the hiring of a second person. And importantly, the first one would be for an adult mental health worker, and the second one would be for a child and young person's mental health worker. It's also important to recognise that there would not be additional funding for the second one. That would have to come either from your IRRS roles funding or from other funding outside of that. And it absolutely needs the confirmation and the support of your local mental health trust in terms of hiring that. So it is possible, but there's a couple of hoops to jump through. Thank you, Dr. Ursula Montgomery, who's given us that clarification. And let's get back to the episode, shall we? And the other key thing is the London waiting that's happened this year. So if you are working within London, both inner and outer London, there is an additional waiting that is available for the ARS funding, which I know has been really appreciated by many people. I still think there needs to be consideration of places like Manchester, Birmingham, where actually the cost of living is almost equivocal, if not so much more. But at least it's something that has changed and that's really useful. Is there more that can be done? absolutely looking at various other types of roles would be really nice and particularly looking at the whole hr costing that's coming into this and absolutely the supervision costs that are coming for these roles is something that needs to happen in my personal view but we're not going to focus on that because well a we talked about that in more detail in the des review that we've done but also we're focusing on the roles themselves so let's get started with them right now and going through them each individually so first up we've got the clinical pharmacist role and this is a role that many of you have probably been experienced and used for because it's one of the first roles that started off with the PCN DES contract. And actually, there is a requirement to have a 0.5 whole time equivalent per PCN. That is the only required number of PCN workforce that you have to have. So it's really important you're aware of that. And if you drop below that, which shouldn't really happen now that we're in year three, but if you did, it's something you need to be aware of because if not, it's going to be a slight problem potentially. So do check out the details of the contract there. I'm not going to talk in great detail about this role because it's probably a role that is very well used within primary care at this moment in time. We are seeing some benefits of this. I think it's really important to note that there are some considerations you need to have. The supervision of these roles, I know for many networks, is a growing challenge, partly because it's one of the most intensive ones that requires supervision. But also, how do you provide that since that's not actually funded through the PCN DES contract itself? Yes, there is the £1.50, but there's so many different calls on the £1.50 that many people are to be honest, questioning how much more thinner you can spread that amount of money. There are various schemes being looked at. So, for example, through training hubs and various other places. And there is the OD funding that is available. But it's important to recognize that the supervision, particularly the pharmacist roles and all the other roles themselves, is really a key concern. It's important to note that for the pharmacists themselves, they're meant to have supervision from a senior clinical pharmacist. In addition, they are meant to have supervision from a GP once every three months at the very least. And in addition, there is the supervision within the practice themselves when they're doing their clinic work to make sure they've got someone to talk to and also understand how to deal with the clinical situation they've got. So there is quite a lot in there already put in. However, it is a role that can have real benefit in general practice. I know personally in our practice, it's something we've been using for several years now. I know there has been the transfer from the earlier NHS England pharmacist schemes, and I've forgotten the name of it. And there are various different ways you can use this. I think the role for pharmacists is one that has been, however, well established. And we're seeing clear benefits in terms of the way that this can deliver better primary care for patients. It is important to note that the clinical pharmacist role is one of the key ones for delivering the structured medication review aspect of the DES, which my colleague Andy is going to be covering in more detail. And there has been some extensions to that and details for that that you do need to be aware of, in particularly how you're going to do this in practice. But enough on the clinical pharmacist. Like I said, there's lots of information already available for those particular roles. Let's have a look at associated role, the pharmacy technician role. So this is a role that has been around since last year and potentially is one area that many more practices are looking at investing into because there is potential that this role can have benefit in primary care. I think it can be an absolute adjunct to the clinical pharmacist and in particular if you're looking at creating a team to deal with your pharmacist-based work, so things like medication reviews, support for patients, all that kind of stuff, the pharmacy technician can be a real asset potentially in terms of helping within those roles. And the fact that it costs a little bit less means that you may potentially get more mileage out of it. 
one particular idea I am going to give you that you may want to consider, and particularly if this is a focus for your particular practice as a network that you may want to look at, is how patients are requesting medications. Now, increasingly, we're seeing more and more patients do this online, and that is something potentially that will develop further, particularly through the pharmacies themselves. However, I know some places where they've done medication request lines, and you could potentially use pharmacy technicians to help supervise the clinical aspect of this using care coordinator roles to help guide patients in terms of managing their medications or requesting them appropriately. I think there are massive potential saving benefits that can have on this in terms of drug budgets and making sure that patients are not wasting medications inappropriately by helping to educate them about their medications every time they request them. It is something that will require investment and potentially the staffing will be covered by the ARS roles. Unfortunately, the other parts may, well, they won't be. So that may be looking at how you're going to do the various other aspects like the telephony, the setup costs, and obviously change in structure you have within practice. But potentially, I think that's a really good way of using these roles in combination with the pharmacist to provide and deal with a really challenging area for many practices in terms of how patients request their medications. Also can lead to real benefit in terms of the route and flow of patients through practices systems. I don't know. What do you think of that? Is that something that you would want to consider for your practice? If that's the case, leave a comment down below. Really would appreciate your views on that particular aspect. Next, we're moving on to the social prescribing link worker role. So again, this is one of the more longer established roles, and it's one of the first ones that started off in year one. So many practices I know have been looking at investing in this. And this was originally the one that the only role NHS Link was going to fully fund, but obviously that changed following the changes to the PCN DES contract in year two. Now, I know many people still question in some ways how much benefit social prescribing link workers can have. I don't. I think there is real benefit that they can provide, but it can be a more challenging one to see because you're not going to see a direct impact of the, the role itself within your practice immediately. However, providing additional support, and particularly post-COVID, that we're going to have with many patients facing significant challenges in terms of how they deal with the other part of life apart from the medical health, is something that I think where the social prescribing link workers can have real benefits and particularly work in combination with some of the other roles we're going to talk about. I think there's real improvements to patient health that could be achieved. The fact that it's not clinical, I know from some particular GPs is going to be a massive issue. Fair enough. You know, they're not going to take away direct clinical work from us. But actually, if you can activate that patient to be working in a more effective way, so they're accessing services, having hopefully less issues with self-neglect or understanding their health needs a lot more effectively, Actually, that may help in the longer run. It is one of those ones that I think takes a bit of time for some people to see the real benefit of, but potentially can have benefit. And that's an adjunct to the next role, the health and well-being coaches. Now, health and well-being coaches, I think, have real potential benefit in helping with the population health of our areas. And again, activating patients to have more better and overall generally deeper kind of care and stuff. I think there are various different ways you can use them in your practice and your network. And I'm going to give, send some examples for you that you can have a listen to if you want to on a podcast link from the General Practice Podcast with Ben Gowland that you're more than welcome to have a listen to. It's a good episode that explains what the health and well-being coaches could potentially achieve in your practice. One area I see real benefit for them is looking at things like group consultations for patients. And this can be in various different ways. I know group consultations is something that many places are potentially looking at expanding into because of the benefits it can give in terms of patient education and also helping them again in terms of the activation of their health journey. But I think it's really important to recognize that actually with the health and care well-being roles, these are the ones that can really help facilitate those sessions and do a bit more of the admin, but also the engagement with the patients to get them on board, to help access various other services, and particularly in key areas such as patient onboarding, something that we're really bad at doing in general practice, you know, helping the patients to understand the healthcare system. Because let's be honest, most clinicians don't understand the healthcare system and how to access it. So how can we expect our patients to? I don't know. You tell me what you think. But I personally believe that using group consultations with the concept of onboarding patients to how they use your practice, how they use your area, and understanding that journey that they need to take will have potential benefits in terms of not hitting against that rock wall that they do every time they come to a block in the service and things. I mean, there's some really good examples of group consultations. Things like diabetes, COPD are well known. But what about things like chronic pain or obesity management? Okay, yes, the slimming world and various things like that. But actually, we know that the obesity and weight crisis, particularly post-COVID, is going to be a real challenge. And we've seen the impact that can have in the general health as well. So actually, this may be something to really consider investing your time and resources in if you have the opportunity to do so. And that can work really well with the next role, the care coordinator role. So 
most people are probably aware of how a care coordinator works. It's about navigating the patient through various different aspects of the healthcare system. And that can work really well. I think there are different ways that you can use care coordinators, though, and I think there are some really innovative ones that you may want to consider. So when we're looking at care coordinators, what could you look at? Well, I know in our network, we're looking at a safeguarding care coordinator. So this is someone to support our practices with a safeguarding caseload that they have in terms of understanding the administrative aspect of it, but also helping to engage and negotiate with patients that we're having particular challenges with or to understand their issues, you know, particularly the did not bring to appointments, that did not attend, that kind of stuff, getting a bit more detail of that. Yes, again, that's something that other parts of the system could help with, but often you need that combined approach, that collaborative aspect. And let's be honest, practices sometimes are so overburdened with trying to deal with this that it, it's one of the things that's harder to deal with. Additionally, they can obviously help with responses in terms of information sharing. For example, when we ask for reports and that kind of stuff, preparing them at the very least and obviously having a GP or clinician overview that. But I think that's real potential innovation that we're going to try to see if that works within our local network. There are clearly others as well. There's the opportunity of using cancer care coordinators, particularly with the cancer des aspect of things, and looking at how we pick up cancers a lot earlier and potentially looking at things like screening, engaging patients to understand why they've got hesitant about particular things like smears or breast screening or bowel screening, that kind of stuff, and having an additional role to help us negotiate that with the patients can be a real benefit. You could potentially consider having care coordinators within your practice, again, to navigate patients through the different aspects, particularly if they're being onboarded or even simple things like making sure that, that acute triage is getting people to the right person. So, for example, as we have a more breadth of roles when it comes to all the clinical ones, actually, this person may be more sensible to be discussed with a you know, physiotherapist rather than a GP and giving them the support and the signposting to use those particular resources. The last one, as many of you know, I'm a bit of a tech geek. So having a digital navigation care coordinator, someone that helps those patients understand the simple things that they may help in terms of their healthcare, like using the NHS app, using online consultations, and having the time to dedicate to show patients how to do that. I think having a role that can help with that will help practices in the long run in terms of navigating patients through different parts of the system. You know, And this can be those patients that are hesitant to use those services. It could also be those patients who overuse those services. Is that something that has a challenge for you? What do you think? Let me know down below in the comments. So those three roles in terms of the social prescribing link worker, the care coordinator, health and wellbeing coach, to be honest, you can combine them a little bit. We've already talked about the pharmacy medication based team. Now we've got that more, you know, holistic patient kind of team that you've got in terms of navigation and understanding of things. Well, let's talk about some of the more clinical facing things. So next up, we've got the physician's associate. Now, the physician associate is an interesting role because I think many people don't quite understand how well these could potentially work. Now, let me be clear. Physician's associates are not doctors. They can, however, help with clinical workload and probably the most broadest in terms of how they can help that directly in terms of the practice workload that you face. In terms of how you can use them, well, there's various different options. Absolutely looking at supporting things like the care homework that we're having to do at the moment and how you can help support that element in terms of having that engagement and relationship with your care homes and dealing with, you know, the clinical workload that comes through that. Additionally, you could consider having them as part of your home visiting service to go out and see patients and engage with them and understand the clinical needs, get the history, do the examination, do the observations, all that kind of stuff for you, and then report that back with the history itself. I know there are some definite GPs out there that see these as kind of like glorified medical students. I don't believe that. We've had a physician associate working in our practice for about two years now, and I will be absolutely honest, she's amazing. She does amazing pieces of work, and I definitely feel it on the days that she's not there. And that can have real benefit in terms of the acute demand, but because of the breadth that they have, it can have real benefit. The challenge with a physician associate is because it's not a really matured role, particularly here in the UK, they are generally more junior staff and absolutely there is that element of supervision and time that needs to go into supporting them. However, I think if you did that, you will see real benefit to your practice and your network in terms of how these roles can support you. Again, if you want some further information about how you can use the physician associates roles in your practice, have a look at the links down below and I'll sell and post you some podcasts that you can have a listen to that go into these roles in significant more depth and I found really useful at helping to understand the roles and how you may want to use them in practice. So next up, let's talk about the first contact physiotherapist role. 
So this is a role in our particular network we've had run up and running for about the past few months or so, but we've actually had previously in our area, but it got stopped because it was a pilot. And I know in some areas, th this is a role that's been found to be really effective. Having first contact physios help to deal with the acute MSK demand that many of us are seeing can be of real benefit. I think for many practices, actually the biggest challenge is signposting patients towards that, particularly since we've moved towards a total triage system. That can work really well, I think, if you've got online consultations. When you've got telephone consultations, it gets a little bit more nebulous because trying to get patients to see a first contact physio initially, particularly when there's not been that experience in the practice, can be a bit more challenging. However, getting that complete physio-based assessment can be of real benefit in terms of understanding the journey of that patient and clearly activating them to move forward in their healthcare needs. Okay, they can't prescribe. Well, well, they can sign posters for certain medications and we are starting to see more prescribing for the physiotherapists that are developing. Is that an issue? Not really. If you've got a good history and you've got a really good assessment that's in your notes, that's the key thing that you can see. Actually, you can then potentially help make that understanding and that information based on the understanding you have of that person. So if you don't trust in their training and the supervision and all the other kind of stuff, that's a separate issue. And that's one that practices will need to look at. But actually, you can see some real benefit with some of these roles and how they can help deal with some of your acute demand. The other part is also helping to get patients moving forward. We know that access to physiotherapy in certain areas when it's really good can mean that patients have less time off work, that leads to less ill health in the long run and less health complications in, down the line. So quick access, really effective. And I think there's some real potential of innovating this role as well. One of the things that many of us probably remember quite well from the pandemic is PE with Joe and the way it exploded in terms of getting children and to be honest, most of us adults, a little bit more active during the lockdown periods and that kind of stuff. Well, why can't we use the physio roles to help support that by looking at a frailty-based first contact physio service that helps particularly patients in care homes develop that kind of support and help when you need it? So various different ways you can, you can do this through a tele, you know, telemedicine kind of approach with having like a PE Joe style thing for those patients in care homes and stuff facilitated with the care home staff and one of the things that we know is that if you improve the muscle mass of most frail patients they have much better outcomes in terms of their general health reduced impact from fractures and stuff in terms of their general stability and generally it's enjoyable it's the endorphins it gives you know it's, it's that pleasure that they can hopefully have yeah clearly there needs to be some adjustment for certain patients but that's where having that support service to help i don't know it's an idea you're welcome to take it if you want to so now we're going to talk about some of the other types of roles that are available. So we've first up, we've got the dietitians. So the dietitians, I think, is a role that many people probably have sidelined because actually dietitian services should be provided by your local area already. And I know there's generally a hesitation of commissioning roles that there's already a service provided for because then that may mean that that service is pulled back and therefore it's not invested in as fully or it's just making up for the fact that it's been poorly commissioned potentially at the moment. However, I think there are particular cohorts of networks and stuff where dietitians in particular can be of real use. Clearly, we are going to see the challenges of the pandemic and we know there's an issue with obesity and the growing amount of that that's happened as a result of potentially less activity, but also the understanding that obesity has a growing health problem anyway across various different areas. Obviously, things like diabetes, COPD, we know that if obesity is coupled in with that, the challenges are more significant. So yeah, you could invest your dietitians to look at weight loss services and particularly looking at further services along those lines. However, there may be other areas that's more pertinent to your particular network. I can clearly see, for example, university-based practices want to invest in potentially anorexia-based services and more you know, support from that point perspective because of potential body images challenges from that younger population that they have much more of that may be prevalent. I think there are also other areas you could consider. It's an interesting area I think that may be worth developing but I completely also understand that's probably a lower priority for many places as well. However, if you've got a really good example, feel free to put it in the comments, but I'd love to know what you think. That works similarly with the podiatry role. So I know in our particular area, the podiatry service could be better. And it is something that we've talked about, whether or not this is something we need to make up for because of the lack of provision. Again, should we be doing that? I, I, I don't know. But actually working that role in combination with some of the other ones, so potentially the first contact physio service. So we know that foot care can lead to massive issues in terms of back pain issues, you know, poorly fitted orthotics and that kind of stuff. That actually sometimes having access to those can lead to certain patients 
being more active and, and more effective from that point of view. Obviously, diabetes care we know has a massive impact when it comes to poor foot care as well. So in terms of chronic disease, group consultations, you know, could you work with a podiatrist to have them support your group consultations route to help patients understand why looking after their feet is so important, particularly in that diabetes cohort. I don't know, there's potentially some options for you to consider there. And next up, we've got the occupational therapist role. So the occupational therapist, again, can be really facilitative in terms of helping activate patients. The MSK stuff is clearly evident in terms of adaptations in the home. But actually, could we use them a little bit more effectively? What about using them with mental health workers to support and facilitate the way that they engage with your patients? So could you use occupational therapists to help manage some of the aspects of the challenges that many of our patients with significant issues with depression and anxiety can have in terms of you know adaptations in the home looking at how they can engage with other kind of services kind of like a, a more clinical focused version of social link prescribing workers i don't know i think that's something that maybe we're missing a trick on and how we can innovate to use these particular roles to help the other option is to help them in terms of dealing with occupational health issues so patients with significant periods off work well how, how can we help with those kind of assessments that may help in terms of things like ergonomics in their desk education in that perspective you know um, working in their own environment you know again are we bordering on parts where we're doing work that should be done through other parts of the system possibly i wonder if that's how they why they've been included maybe i don't know tinfoil hat maybe who knows so now we're going to take a look at some of the newer roles that have come accessible through the ars scheme first up we've got the nursing associates role now i must admit I'm not quite sure what a nursing associate is. The best way I can figure it out that it's somebody that's on the path of becoming a nurse or a nurse practitioner, but it's not quite there yet. So somewhere in between a healthcare assistant and a nurse is best as I can figure it out. But there is a progression there in terms of supporting practices and patients in terms of their health needs. They can do fairly similar things in terms of doing vaccinations, ECGs, phlebotomy, various aspects along those lines, as well as patient-led care. I, I wonder if this is one that was brought in because of the vaccination schemes itself and how they can therefore support the role of using the ARS funding to develop and use the vaccination schemes. And we know that the vaccination scheme is not going away anytime soon. Even once the COVID one is gone, we're then going to hit flu season and there may have to be further aspects of this developed over the years. And again, remembering that the IMS part has been massively included in QOF and the criteria is quite high in terms of what you need to achieve as well. So having access to roles that can help support you doing that from a network perspective, particularly since the vaccination part is now within the network's remit to deliver, actually, it's nice to have a role that can help with this. How that works with the next one, the training nursing associates role, which just seems like the next step down from that. OK, I think it can be really useful to help activate people on the nursing pathway and what they can do. But again, this kind of seems like it's a healthcare assistant light as best as I can understand but it's a progression in terms of going hopefully then to the nursing associates or to a nurse from that particular route particularly for those that haven't done the degree of nursing is that a good thing is that a bad thing I'll be honest this is an area I'm still not quite sure on myself so more than happy to have somebody tell me how we can better use these particular roles and if that's the case again let me know in the comments down below so just before we move on to the two final roles that are available if you have found this content useful leave me a like down below to let me know this has been effective and useful for you really would appreciate it and leave me a comment in terms of which role you so far you think has been most useful for your particular practice and network the next one we're going to talk about though is the paramedics so the paramedics is a role that you can now actually go out and hire it's one of the two roles that we were told about way back at the beginning, but we didn't have access to through the funding, but it, that is now available. And I think there's real benefit in particular areas how you may want to use this. Clearly, the paramedics can help us with acute demand for patients in terms of potentially triaging, you know, acute demand itself, but also obviously things like home visiting services and aspects along those lines. I know various different areas are looking at how they can deliver this. And there is absolutely an issue in terms of how the, where this workforce is going to come from, because what we don't want to do is obviously strip out all the various different members that work within the ambulance service, because then, well, we're not going to have any people to take patients to hospital when we need them. However, what that means in the long run, I think it's worth that the networks are clearly working with the ambulance service to find out the best way of finding these individuals. I think they've got some real potential of helping practices in terms of the way that they work particularly with acute clinical demand, which is clearly one of the bigger challenges we've got right now. And that leads on to the final, which is the one I mentioned way back at the start, and that's the mental health workers. 
So this was the one that's had probably the most change from its original outset. And the reason for that is the absolute limitation that has been put on the number of people we can hire for the role. Just to remind everyone, so unless you are a network size of over 100,000 patients, you are only eligible to have one full-time equivalent mental health worker for your particular network. And it does need to be co-hosted with your local mental health trust. In fact, they will actually be doing the hiring for it. As a result of that, you only have to provide 50% of the funding, but the work is done 100% in the network. How that will actually function, I think is going to be really interesting to see. I know we've been having discussions with our local mental health trust for the past several months, and we're still trying to figure out how the best way that they can actually work, because increasingly there are more challenges when it comes to all the governance and the HR. It's really complicated. It would have been nice if they just said, go out and do it. I can understand that the issue with that is clearly the fact that if they had said that, again, stripping out the mental health service in terms of the various different members of staff they have doesn't work productively. And I gather that the PCN returns that we all had to do earlier had a massive impact potentially in that because obviously this is information that's come out since then. So who knows? I think the real challenge for this particular role, though, is how one whole time equivalent is going to be shared across various practices. And there may be that consideration that actually it's not shared, that you just prioritize it in one or two practices and then say that next year another practice is going to get that resource. That's going to be a really uncomfortable conversation, though, because of the fact that so many practices are going to be seeing such a significant increase in mental health challenges for our patients, especially because of the pandemic. Let's be honest, most of us working within the healthcare system have had more increasing challenges with mental health issues, stress and anxiety and potentially even depression, let alone some of the other more complicated areas of it. So our patients absolutely are potentially looking at that as well. How this progresses, I would love to hear ideas people have had of how they can use that one whole time equivalent effectively across their practices. I know potentially there's been talk about using MDT meetings and that kind of stuff to navigate patients. Well, it would clearly be nice if it was the original first contact mental health worker role as it was originally designed, because actually I think that would have been more effective. However, yeah, we, we need to find these people from somewhere. So I guess that's the big issue with it. I said there were two roles. Actually, I forgot there's one more. And this is the newer role that's been added in. And this is the advanced practitioner role. So this is an interesting one because it potentially could be any of the earlier clinical based roles. So in terms of the pharmacist, the physiotherapist, the paramedics and the physician associates working as an advanced practitioner. And there's clearly a focus on this particular role of using it from the acute demand aspect, but also potentially using it from a leadership role to coordinate the teams that you've got. And I think that works potentially really well. It is one of the higher funded areas of the particular roles that are available. And as a result of that, I think it could have real benefit for particular individual networks. So as you look at creating these teams, because increasingly with the number of funding each network is going to have, actually, we are going to have teams of people working for each network. That is an issue in terms of supervision. That is an issue in terms of direction and leadership. And clearly with that, we are going to have to see increasing amounts of an attention to the returns that we will have to do. So just to remind you that you do have to send in your workforce returns. That'll be the end of August for the first one. So that's 21-22. And that's to let you know what kind of funding is then left over that you may want to have access to and then have to bid for in your local networks if you haven't used all your potential ARS funding. And then at the end of October, we will need to also put in your kind of prospective reviews that you may want to put in for various networks. And then from the end of October, you also have to put in that return for what you're looking at for the next couple of years in terms of your workforce planning and stuff. And I guess, again, this may feed into what then available roles we have and the kind of depth and all the other kind of stuff moving forward. So EGP learners, I hope you found this review of the ARS roles useful. There's loads of information in there. Feel free to go back and watch particular parts if you want to. Alternately, if you want to look at the complete DES kind of review, feel free to check out this video right here that gives you more details on that with myself and Andy talking about it. Alternately, I'm sure YouTube's recommending another video for you right here. And as always, EGP learners, we're here to help save you and your patients time by taking hands in primary care and learning. And we'll catch you in the next episode.